Good morning, everybody. It's Andrew Ross Sorkin um, of the New York Times, founder of DealBook. Thank you so very much for joining us on this week's DealBook Debrief. Uh, we are thrilled to have as our very special guest, Brett Stevens, uh, the opinion columnist for the paper. And uh, we have a lot of questions about reopening the economy, the politics of it, the politics of bailouts, and where we are all headed. I am joined uh, this morning again uh, by Jason Carrion, who is DealBook's editor. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to a terrific conversation, which we want to be as interactive as possible. So I should say in advance, if you have questions, and so many of you uh, have been sending in questions already, uh, please do so. You can do it right now in the Q&A window, and we'll be getting to them in just a minute. One piece of housekeeping, this is an audio-only uh, call, as we say every week. Uh, so if you're looking for video, it doesn't exist, but it does allow you uh, to maybe check email or other things and listen to us in your ears. And we should finally note that we are recording this and we'll make a replay available uh, in the DealBook newsletter tomorrow morning. We'll make it available on nytimes.com and we will definitely push it out over social. Um, so good morning to you, Brett, and good morning to you, Jason. Are you with us? Uh, yeah, hi there, Andrew. I'm here. I was waiting for Brett. I'm here, Andrew. Sorry. There, great. I, I, Brilliant. I, I, Brilliant. I, I just want to make sure we it. got all the voices. Yeah. So here, here's where I want to start the conversation, because we are in the process, Brett, of, of reopening America uh, to some degree and in, in certain places. And in certain places, we are still living in quarantine. And you've been uh, writing a lot about the politics of this, about the politics uh, of this particular moment, and in particular, uh, you've recently uh, written about this idea that America, as we think about reopening, shouldn't have to play by New York rules. And, and I want to discuss that, and I also want to discuss this idea of the cure uh, being worse than the disease. Another point that you've, you've made um, multiple times in terms of thinking about the balance uh, between the healthcare uh, issues and or lives and livelihoods, if you will, and, and, and how, how you think about that. So when you think about the balance, meaning how you strike the right balance to really reopen and what that looks like, what does that look like to you? Well, it looks like a process of experimentation, Andrew, um, and which is why I think uh, on balance we are better served by a federal uh, system that allows 50 uh, different governors uh, to uh, find solutions that uh, make sense locally, uh, as well as to make mistakes that don't uh, affect us uh, uh, nationally. I don't think there is a, a kind of um, uh, a, 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 a philosophical, you know, sort of a, a prescription that has the, you know, imprimatur of a uh, of, of uh, quasi divine authority that is going to uh, that is going to work for us. We are all feeling our way through a crisis, um, the shape of which is difficult to foresee, and through a, a disease, uh, aspects of which uh, remain uh, unknown not just to the public but to uh, the scientific community. So we we are what we need to do is uh, is find our way um, and make sure that uh, solutions that are sensible in areas like New York City, where I'm speaking from now, which are concentrated, dense, um, uh, don't have the kind of built-in social distancing that other parts of the country do, that that th those solutions are tailored to. Um, to, to, to more local realities. Uh, final point is that no solution uh, that I can think of doesn't entail huge downside uh, risks and costs. And the idea that there is, there's one kind of solution that works and another that, uh, and others that simply don't, I think is a, is a misconception. Okay, but let me ask you about this then, about the federal system and the idea of, of states doing this, if you will, uh, idiosyncratically, uh, based on their own experiences, which is to say that to, to the extent that the United States is one big pool, um, you can't, and I, you, you've probably seen this on Twitter, people say, you can't have a peeing section in a pool. You can't, because what happens in one state, given that we haven't shut down air travel, 
and we haven't shut down the interstate highways, um, you, you, you can't effectively allow one state to do one thing and another state to do another thing. And it's why in, in large part, some of the, the governors, at least uh, on the West Coast and the East Coast seem to be trying to do it together. Uh, well, I mean, look, to some extent, that is, that is uh, of course, uh, right. If you're going to reopen parts of the economy, there is going to be a risk of spread. The idea that COVID is not going to continue to spread is an idea that we should uh, banish from our heads. Question is, how do we balance uh, risks? There are large parts of this country where the incidence of uh, COVID-19 is relatively rare and where the burdens being placed on local economies because uh, barbershops are, cut, uh, are shut down, restaurants are, uh, restaurants are shut down, movie theaters are shut down, all, the, all of those things are immense. And so you're gonna have to ask yourself the question, where does that, where, how do you strike the right balance at a given moment uh, in time? There may be occasions where uh, restrictions that have been lifted are going to have to be reimposed. And the more testing we do, the more uh, precisely and intelligently we are going to be able to, uh, to reimpose them. But to take the theoretical reality that at some point this thing is, is going to spread and not allow for any give in terms of the balance between the interests of uh, diminishing the incidence of COVID-19 and at the same time, uh, not uh, crashing the economy, which by the way, the economy is lives, food on the table. It's not just, you know, uh, uh, profits and, and, and uh, country homes, but that, that that balance has to be uh, respected. So I think a process of kind of consistent, intelligent, careful experimentation is a much better, is a much better approach than simply saying, we're going to lock down this country for 18 months because that's the only way uh, we're going to stop that. By the way, last point, I'm going on too long, but last point, that itself is a fantasy because there are other countries over which we have no control, but uh, we, are, uh, we are ultimately also susceptible to um, uh, disease coming in from abroad. So, so it's a fantasy that we can just go into this endless lockdown. Okay, let me make it more complicated. Everybody wants their kids to go back to school, and it's probably the ultimate conundrum because it has a huge economic effect. If the kids are at home, parents can't go to work, creates a huge, uh, huge dilemma. And yet right now, we're also in a, in a situation where you have teachers unions, especially in, in, in New York, for example, but in other states as well, that are saying, we don't want the teachers, to, the teachers don't want to go back to school. How do you handle that? Because that becomes a really very tricky situation. Uh, of course it is. Um, uh, and one way of handling it is to say, is to give both students as well as teachers uh, opt out mechanisms. Um, that is to say, if a teacher thinks that his or her uh, health situation or family situation makes it very difficult to return to a school environment, uh, they ought to be able to opt out and to be able to do so without risk of, of uh, losing their jobs. If parents feel that uh, their kids should not go to school because they're afraid of the children uh, getting uh, uh, COVID or, or bringing it uh, back home. They also ought to be able to, uh, uh, to opt out. But at some point, we're, it probably makes sense to start exposing uh, populations that are least at risk of uh, incurring fatal cases of COVID-19 of actually exposing them to the virus. At least, of course, that assumes that this virus um, operates in the way that uh, that uh, some other viruses do. That's not absolutely clear, but I think that's the those are the assumptions that, for instance, have uh, countries like Denmark uh, um, sending uh, reopening schools, Germany and elsewhere. Um, I think that's that's what they're thinking. Expose right. populations that are are at less risk and protect populations that are at more risk. Let me ask you a political question because and it has to do with politics, but also has to do with facts, facts on the ground which is that right now, based on a, a recent Ipsos Axios poll, it seems like Republicans and Democrats are looking at the facts, if you will, about this disease and about its impact in very different ways. So uh, this poll that I'm, I'm describing uh, suggests that Republicans believe that the death count is being way overcounted. Mm -hmm. 
And Democrats believe that the death count is being way undercounted. I would also suggest to you that, that healthcare experts, I think, would suggest to you that there's also an undercount uh, taking place. But either way, it also suggests that both sides don't even believe the numbers unto themselves. And what does that do to the ability to have a real debate about these issues? Well, I mean, look, in fact, both things in some sense uh, can be true. Uh, and and this, is, uh, uh, this is what I mean. It is quite likely that in many ways we are undercounting deaths because some deaths in, in nursing homes uh, haven't, uh, haven't uh, uh, come to light. There are people are dying of COVID-19 without ever uh, setting foot in a hospital and being properly uh, diagnosed. And that's why I think some of the work that the Times has done in comparing um, uh, death, the death rates from last uh, March and April to, to this one make a certain amount of sense. A lot of uh, conservatives that I know are saying, you know, there are people who are dying not so much of COVID-19, but with COVID-19, that is comorbidities. They are, they are very sick with something else uh, and they happen to get uh, 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 COVID-19. So, you know, where, how, how exactly do you look at that? There, there is a kind of uh, a definitional question. I think one reason, Andrew, that there is a difference in terms of the approach, obviously the most obvious one is, you know, we, conservatives and, and liberals tend to get their news from, uh, from different sources. But I would say there's this kind of a philosophical uh, difference too, in that I think conservatives and liberals tend to look at the question of risk uh, very differently. Um, and, and so that's, that, that shapes, um, what, what, what do you mean by that? I, I think conservatives are of the view that people ought to be free to take certain risks, uh, uh with, uh, uh, with their health. Um, uh, I guess I'm getting a little, uh, a little ahead of, of the question that you are, uh, uh, that you are posing, but in just, in terms of our general approach to how should we look at this disease and how serious of a risk it is, I think a lot right. of conservatives would say, um, I ought to be free uh, uh, to take risks with my health because other things matter to me at least as much as my, uh, my health does. Of course, the liberal answer is you're not just taking risks with your health, you're taking risks with other people's health. But I think that's one of the reasons why we see this ideological split on what should be, you know, a, a, the sort of subject that ought to, in an ideal world, bring people together rather than divide them. Are you therefore then surprised though by the economic or by the reaction by the administration in terms of how to deal with this economically, which is to say, this is probably the greatest uh, corporate welfare program and, and, and almost socialistic effort, if you will, um, in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of effectively of, of, of privatizing uh, the gains and and socializing the losses than we've ever had in our history. Yeah, I think a line in a column I wrote uh, from a few weeks back is that um, history might remember that it was left to the Trump administration to fulfill Bernie Sanders' uh, uh, agenda of completely socializing the economy. Um, of course, he's doing it at the level of corporations, which Sanders would never countenance, but it's also happening with uh, unemployment roles. I mean, if Trump gets a second term, we may be inevitably forced to move towards a Medicare for all system as, as uh, a majority of the population or a, or a huge number of people are left without, uh, are left without um, uh, health benefits. You think that could happen in a, in a second Trump uh, administration? Trump administration has never exactly been a laissez-faire uh, Wall Street Journal editorial board type of administration when it comes to economic policy. It's always been corporatist protectionist. It has never talked about um, entitlement reform, social security reform uh, in the way that, uh, you know, the Paul Ryan style Republicans uh, did. So I think that's entirely, entirely conceivable in the second Trump administration, uh, if we have a second Trump administration, which, which I also think is probable, but that's another story. So let me ask you a separate question um, just about the relationship between U.S. and China real quick. And I do want to open it up to questions. And I know Jason's uh, plowing through um, so many that are coming in literally as we speak. Uh, you wrote a piece about remdesivir. This is uh, the drug that's uh, 
<laughs> been created by uh, Gilead. And uh, one of the things that's so interesting about it, 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 it and obviously it's, we're all very hopeful that it'll, it'll help people. Uh, oh, it, we should note it's in the hospital, hospitalization setting, not, uh, it's not a pill or something else. But um, the US government has effectively taken control of remdesivir in terms of its distribution, how it's gonna be prioritized, uh, whether it's gonna be shared with other countries. What are the implications of that uh, for somebody who, just before was talking about federalism. Well, I mean, that's slightly a different uh, uh, subject because that's about the relationship of a private company and its intellectual property with, uh, with the federal government, not uh, states. Um, uh, uh, Gilead has gone out of its way to say that it is going to try to make this drug as available and, and as affordable as, uh, as possible. Gilead has also invested a tremendous energies in, in, in creating a drug that, you know, began actually to with the idea of fighting hepatitis C uh, over a decade ago and then failed in Ebola uh, experiments. I think it would be um, prospectively dangerous if this becomes a, uh, a precedent where um, uh, the federal government uh, sort of takes over the process of, of being the main pharmaceutical maker or, or distributor. But you may know more than, uh, you may know something more than I do. Uh, I don't know if this is news that broke in the last day or so. No, 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 no. It's just, I, I, I've just been thinking a little bit about what the implications are for the rest of the world and for our ability to get access to drugs outside of the country, access to other materials. I mean, I think there's right now a bit of a question mark even within the health community about the sort of escalating tension between the United States and China, for example. Yeah. in large part because we are still, at least in this very moment, very reliant on China for access to PPE, other supplies and other things in the supply well, chain that are required for testing yeah. and, and things like that. And so it sort of raises this sort of larger question to me about uh, state controlled uh, processes and, and the fact that we are now to some degree taking control of some of this. Well, look, I think the larger issue that you are raising is uh, the question of the kind of uh, uh, the end of the era of free trade and uh, renationalization of all kinds of industries and a sort of America first approach towards, you know, access to uh, particular drugs and so on. And I think that is uh, uh, economically and strategically uh, dangerous because, uh, I mean, I don't know about remdesivir in terms of the components it requires uh, precisely, but nearly any, uh, any complex manufacturing process, and I know Remdesivir is a complex manufacturing process, requires inputs that, uh, and supply chains that are global. And the moment that you start uh, interrupting uh, those uh, right. or disrupting those supply chains, you're playing a dangerous game and it's a game that two can play. So if we start attempting to punish other nations or prefer ourselves, uh, in, if for, for one given product or drug uh, or service or whatever it is, um, the same will be done to us and we'll be back to the races of the, you know, beggar thy neighbor right. policies and smoot holly and all the rest of it. Right. Okay, last question for me and then we'll, we, I promise I'll open it up, which is I just wanted to talk about the, the conundrum that we are all going to face given the municipalities and states and cities that are going to run into real economic trouble and hardship. Uh, over the next likely several year, if not longer. Uh, and the uniqueness, which is to say that it seems to be, it, it's likely to be split along very political lines, meaning blue states are likely to be in a lot more trouble given where we've seen this disease spread than necessarily red states. And how you think the politics of that are going to develop and evolve. That, that, that's, uh, you know, obviously we had a foretaste of that with uh, Mitch McConnell's um, uh, musings on, on, on bankruptcy, which I thought were uh, politically uh, inapt uh, on, on, on his part uh, and potentially unwise. Um, uh, a lot of blue states, uh, Illinois and others, have huge pension liabilities uh, that are that are going to come to uh, haunt them in this uh, in this crisis. They're going to have huge tax revenue 
or general revenue uh, shortfalls. Um, and uh, uh, the temptation is going to be, you know, Ford to City, drop dead. Uh, McConnell to, to Albany, drop, uh, drop dead. I think that's, that's, a, that's an area where, where I think Republicans have to tread very carefully because while we want to find a solution uh, or better solutions to the COVID crisis uh, uh, locally or, or, or federally and allow states to sort of figure out what works uh, for them, uh, I think Republicans would be foolish to abandon a sense that we're also in this together, that there's a, there are questions of national solidarity. Um, now, the, the depth of the economic crisis, Andrew, may be such that uh, decisions are going to be forced on Washington and uh, the states that, uh, uh, that are purely actuarial and, and not economic. Uh, the, the rate at which, which, it, the rate at which uh, we are cratering as an economy is, is so frightening and, and, and it doesn't just beggar description, it beggars our historical imagination. We just don't know how this is going to play out. Uh, and it's, um, you know, I kind of dread waking up and uh, going to uh, nytimes.com and seeing what, you know, the, the catastrophe that has befallen us overnight. Today it's 3.2 million unemployed in the space of a week. Uh, there are a few words for that. Well, with, with that uh, very optimistic note, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jason, who I know has uh, all of the questions that uh, hundreds of readers, uh, we have thousands of people on this call, but hundreds of readers have been sending in. Jason, take it away. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And, and, and thanks, thanks again, Brett, for joining us. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for writing in your questions. We're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. But first, there's quite a few, Brett, in passing, you mentioned Trump's reelection prospects. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of questions they're asking for clarification. You mentioned we might get into it later. So tell us what you think is going to happen come November and maybe how the pandemic plays into that. Well, I mean, look, the obvious point is that uh, Trump uh, expected to ride to reelection on the strength of a uh, relatively uh, or I should say very robust economy, uh, that's, uh, that's clearly not going to happen. But Trump has uh, advantages uh, against uh, Biden that are uh, formidable. The advantages of incumbency, the advantages of being in the White House, not a, not a basement in Delaware. Huge, huge fundraising advantages and the advantages of being able to take uh, to take uh, policy initiatives that may or may not uh, work, but are going to sound uh, hopeful to a lot of people. You saw just this other day, started talking about uh, tax cuts. That's going to be attractive to a lot of people. But the biggest problem is that right now, other than saying that he's not crazy, not evil, and he's Barack Obama's best friend, uh, it's hard to discern uh, the affirmative case for the Joe Biden presidency. I don't think he's articulated a kind of a large idea of what his presidency uh, would be about other than uh, return to normalcy. Uh, I mean, it worked for Warren Harding, I guess, uh, but it's, it's not a particularly uh, resounding rallying cry. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, Biden is ahead in, in, in polls but I see that Trump is ahead in all the betting pools. And, and my experience of this is that the betting pools tend to know uh, more than the polls do uh, because money is riding on it. A question from Peter about a, about a different Democrat asking, why is Cuomo getting the adulation he is other than the, the comments that he's making about being honest, forthright, and so on, you know, given what's happening where you and Andrew are in, in, in and around New York? Uh, city, um, why is he getting the adulation? Is, is, is how Peter. I think it, it, it goes to the strength of his performances, uh, uh, those those news conferences, and the contrast there uh, that inevitably one draws with uh, the, the conference, the news conferences, or whatever you want to call them, uh, uh, that 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 Trump was putting on. That Cuomo conveys a sense of moral seriousness, knowledgeability, and command um, that has, uh, you know, that lends the impression of uh, actual uh, leadership. And much as I can find fault with some of the decisions that Cuomo uh, has, uh, has made, uh, it's hard, I think, for any normal person to come away from watching one of those performances and not say, well, here's a governor who really knows what he's doing. And he has seized the uh, 
the national stage uh, in a way that few other governors uh, have with a kind of combination of uh, almost fatherly authority and, uh, uh, and a sense of empathy. Uh, that is, at least in terms of presentation, if not in terms of policy, that's what leadership looks like. Right. And another sort of related question about Governor DeSantis in Florida, I'm going to sort of paraphrase this one coming in, that this, you know, this listener su suggests that, that he is not getting, um, he's, he's, he's getting negative finger pointing, as they, as they put it, and the final chapter has not been written. Uh, that's, you know, taking a very different approach, obviously, to Cuomo in different circumstances, too. But how do you approach, you know, that strategy, if you can call it that, in, in, in Florida? Well, the numbers speak very well for Florida, and mm -hmm. they don't speak well for the people who were claiming that DeSantis's allegedly lackadaisical approach to the crisis was going to lead to um, uh, huge numbers of uh, uh, huge numbers of deaths. Now, whether that is a function of uh, more enlightened policy by DeSantis or simply a function of uh, uh, luck and circumstance that Florida enjoys compared to other states, whether it's on account of warm weather uh, or kind of built-in social distancing and lack of a kind of urban density that you have in Manhattan, uh, we're going to have to figure that out uh, in the months and and and. Uh, ye uh, years ahead. But I'll, I'll, I'll make one point, which is that DeSantis certainly benefited from the, uh, from, from the tidal wave of criticism uh, that predicted uh, catastrophes that, uh, that didn't emerge. And I think it's, it sort of behooves all of us as we're sort of talking and writing about this crisis to do it with a little bit of humility with respect to our predictions uh, I mean, we should do that in all cases, but especially now when uh, so much uh, is simply, you know, there's so many uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns to, to borrow that uh, Rumsfeld line. Uh, you had talked about different attitudes towards risk earlier, and there's, and there's two questions here that I want to combine on that point. One from Debbie asking about the spread of the idea that accepting the concept that, that, it's, that it's okay, quote unquote, for seniors and others to die in order to open up the country more rapidly. And then Kirk uh, has a similar sort of um, question here on the question of risk and rights. How do you square the attitude that people who are medically compromised and are, are in effect expendable for the greater good when it comes to the, what he calls the conservative case, um, you know, to uh, open up the economy? Well, let me state at least my view that nobody is expendable. Um, you know, I have an elderly mother who I care for very dearly and don't want her uh, in any way uh, exposed to, uh, uh, to COVID. Um, so it, I, think, I, I think we want to divorce this question of um, uh, the assessment of risk from making kind of morally charged claims that, you know, some people are just okay with you know, letting, letting grandma and grandpa die for the sake of, you know, keeping, uh, uh, you know, keeping the condominium uh, in, uh, uh, in Fort Lauderdale or, 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 or wherever it is. The balance of risks has to be measured in the following way, which is to say that just as we want to maintain, do our utmost to protect vulnerable populations, we also have to be sensitive to the fact that consequences of, of those uh, protections um, spill over in uh, ways that are also immensely damaging. And there's been a, uh, I think it's unfortunate that people have started speaking about this as lives versus economy, as, a, 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 as if the word economy doesn't contain within it um, real questions of public health and not just livelihood, but also life itself. Uh, uh, I am, I am not aware um, of any situation where millions of people are becoming uh, reliant on food banks, uh, where people's uh, mental health is in serious jeopardy, where that doesn't also have knock-on effects, serious knock-on effects in terms of uh, mortality. So let's, let's just, when we just talk about the balance of risks, let's just be, be use more precise language in, in thinking about how we 
approach this. These are these are these. This is balancing risks to lives in in different ways. It's not just simply life itself versus money. And to and to continue on that theme, another another two parter here that I'm going to combine. Robert um, says we hear much about my rights from individuals who demand the economy to reopen and things return to normal. But what about the responsibilities of citizenship in this era? And he says, uh, has the Trump era dispensed with the need to be responsible as well as politically correct? That's sort of part one. And then, and then maybe I'll just ask the follow up now. Charles asks, do you feel that Americans have more or less empathy for one another than before the pandemic? I should hope we have more empathy. Um, and look, you know, this is a country that has, uh, I think, on a on broad consensus, accepted the reality of uh, profound economic downsides to protect uh, vulnerable populations, people in nursing homes, people with uh, 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 compromised immune systems. Someone ought to acknowledge, uh, uh, someone ought to acknowledge, uh, you know, that, that we've done that. Sorry, I just, I, I've, I, remind me of your first question. The first question was was kind of related to that about the responsibilities of citizenship. You know, talking ah, about yes, my rights returning to normal versus being a good citizen, if you want to put it like that. Empathy. Well, uh, empathy is hugely important. Being a good citizen is uh, is very important. We're going to try to practice the most exemplary citizenship when we are no longer under forcible lockdowns and instead have to uh, be thoughtful people in, in everyday life when it means wearing a face mask in, in, in public, where it means... Uh, refusing to gather in, in large parties or, or host, uh, uh, you know, host parties where, where, where people are, are uh, you know, can, where the disease can spread, uh, uh, can spread uh, very, very widely. But we have to take a, we have to have an, a concept of the totality of life and uh, the common good, which uh, includes, but also goes on the immediate risks of COVID-19. Right. And to ask a question here that's kind of about corporate citizenship from Harvey, who's a deal book reader who wrote in by email earlier. Do you have faith that Big Pharma does what's best for the public at large or for their own pocketbooks? Well, I have faith that they, they <laughs> probably do both. And I don't see why the two are, are necessarily contradictory. I think there are very few of us uh, who aren't in some ways uh, uh, indebted in ways that we never think about to big pharma for uh, uh, innovations, drugs, therapies that have uh, at one point or another saved our lives or made, uh, made our lives much better. Now, the, the deeper question here about corporate responsibility is also, I think, about corporate reputation. And maybe I'd go even further and say the reputation of capitalism is, uh, is at stake. This is something that I've, I've been thinking about uh, uh, for uh, for a while, you know, even before COVID nineteen, uh, capitalism was under uh, scrutiny and uh, ideological attack in a way that uh, we haven't seen in about uh, thirty years. And and the rise of uh, Bernie Sanders in the U S. Uh, uh, the period of Corbynism in the U K. A lot of a lot of things attest to the fact that young people, especially young people who came of age during the last Great Recession, don't don't see capitalism as, uh, or, or free market system as, as something to admire or something that has done much, much for them. Uh, so I, I think that those people who either run large corporations or people who are uh, billionaires ought to be very mindful of the way in which uh, they behave, um, of the uh, choices they make in terms of pur or purchases they make, things they say, uh, because uh, eras of economic uh, contraction and depression tend to be eras of political and social revolution. So anyone who actually thinks sincerely that free market economies are the most uh, robust way to spread prosperity as far as possible, um, they have to be good stewards uh, in their personal life of, uh, of that ethic. Um, a friend of mine uh, has pointed out, my, my colleague Frank Bruni uh, has pointed out to me that there might, we might have a Lizzie Grubman moment, if you'll, if you'll remember that moment from, from about uh, 20 years ago or so. Um, uh, 
uh, where one what one act sort of crystallizes rage against uh, uh, an entire class, um, and uh, people should be should be very uh, thoughtful about that, especially those who who cherish free markets. If I can sort of take my host privilege here to follow up on that in. Dealbook today, we wrote a bit about universal basic in income mm -hmm. and how, you know, interest is, is, is maybe rising a bit in that sort of notion. And I, I talked to a researcher who said that, you know, out of crises emerge new universals. And this is one of them. And, and the U.S. is already sending checks to, you know, most people. What do you, how do you, how do you feel about that? That is a pretty major uh, re, remaking of this, of the state and, and, and uh, pushing it in a different sort of direction. Is that an idea who that might resurface? Uh, well, it is resurfacing. I mean, it was mm -hmm. there. It was it was what made Andrew Yang's candidacy right. interesting, other than you know uh, whatever the math slogan uh, that 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 he uh, championed. Um, it's actually an idea that has uh, some cross-cutting ideological appeal. Uh, another advocate of universal basic income uh, is uh, none other than the libertarian uh, uh, social scientist Charles Murray. Um, of course, Murray's version of the universal basic income, as I understand it, uh, and he was talking about it years ago, so my memory is probably a little bit hazy, is that universal basic income should serve as a substitute for other forms of uh, state subsidy, welfare, and uh, uh, other, uh, uh, other sorts of protections. So um, uh, the, the question that I have about UBI is, um, is uh, lies lies in the details. If UBI is just another extra, um, how, whatever it is, 30,000 bucks in everyone's pocket on top of all the social protections that we have, that's one story. If it replaces them, it's quite another. Mm. And just a final question uh, here. We're running out of time from an, from an anonymous list, listener, which is pretty important, I think. How do states protect and compensate frontline workers who are more at risk in this crisis? No one should be looked at as expendable. Um, they say, and I think also maybe on the other end of this, there's been you know lots of questions and talk about what happens then to the grocery clerks and nurses and all these people who maybe weren't as well compensated in our capitalist system before, but now you know we have sort of a new appreciation, let's say. Well, right, and I think part of corporate responsibility is going to be uh, involve different companies making. Uh, uh, reputationally wise as well as ethically sound decisions to uh, find ways to reward those workers who have been on the front lines uh, and and taking risks with their with their health and and, and with their families in order to to, uh, 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 to serve us uh, uh, to serve us well I mean I don't know what the model is I mean it might be the model that we had after 9/11 um, with uh, First responders, um, but uh, there's no there, there's no question that that some some large debt is owed to uh, bus drivers, to uh, people in, in in subways and and elsewhere in the in the public system, and of course to you know the, the first responders uh, in, in the health system itself who took extraordinary uh, who took extraordinary risks and have suffered disproportionately in this uh, in in this crisis. That's something that will also um, work its way out, not just in the next uh, 10, but probably uh, next 20 years. Well, I just want to thank everyone for uh, asking questions and, and, and particularly for you, Brett, for answering them so astutely. And I'm going to hand it back to Andrew. You might be on mute. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I think Andrew is on is on mute, but uh, he he will he will figure it out oh, eventually. Oh, here I am. There he I'm is. Here. I just, well, I apologize. I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Jason for uh, steering us through all of uh, your questions and everybody who's on the call. Thank you for your questions. And Brett, thank you for all of these provocative ideas. You have me thinking about all sorts of things uh, in all sorts of new ways. And I hope that we can all do this. Uh, again, very soon. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the call, we will make a replay of all of this available in tomorrow's newsletter as well as on nytimes.com uh, and on social. And uh, we look forward to doing this again very soon. And we will alert you in the newsletter next week. 
Uh, meantime, please, 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 everybody, stay safe, stay healthy, and as sane as you possibly can. Uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks so much.